Sarah Ness is a U.S. Army veteran who served on active duty 1992 to 2000 with a combat tour in Somalia in 1993. Her role as surgical tech in the field hospital was expanded to a combat role in very challenging conditions when troops there were scaled back under mission accomplished. Sarah has undergone treatments for PTSD. She has fought personal isolation, depression, and suicidal ideation. Through her efforts at community with other veterans, as well as her participation in poetry and theater, she finds sustainability, she'll tell you. Sarah is a wife and mother of two children, ages five and nine. Please help me welcome her. Social work department. Her name was Jill, Jillian, and uh, she would have been 38 um, just a few, I want to say, short days or weeks ago. Um, so, how many folks here, uh, by uh, just a show of hands, have ever come across a Somali war veteran? I'm going to need to be in touch with you all. It took me 21 years to come across a Somali war veteran after leaving Mogadishu, outside of uh, the ones that I kept in touch with. And uh, he died of a sailor's heart on June 6th of this year. Gone. Just like that. He's gone. No tears, no goodbyes, head and hands, and it feels cold like ice. Burning regret deep inside. Reaching back to yesterday's to Trace our last goodbyes. Words play in my mind. Do you know what it's like to vaporize a five-year-old kid at close range? On my shoulder, he sobbed. Together, we cried. AJ used to tell him he was a cook in the Navy, a SEAL's life. We don't want to talk about it. Avoidance, an attempt to survive, but there's no taking it back, and you can't undo the lie, and there's no coming back from suicide. As I hear stories of homecoming, as I hear stories of being forgotten, I remember that when we came home in 1993, in August, before the Black Hawks were shot down, we just came home. Our parents, our family members, didn't know to fall to their knees.
thought I made it home safe. Lucky soldier of fortune. Didn't know years later I'd still be shattered and broken. They say time heals all wounds. You need to put it all away. Say that to the 22. Is that really the right number? They never get it right. Probably more like 30 or 40 veterans that killed themselves today. <sighs> I started telling my stories in poetry. I started sharing my stories of moral injury with my brothers and sisters in places and spaces where people weren't being paid to listen. I found sustainability, dealing with a life-threatening condition. It's important to know that when a veteran stands before you, that veteran, he or she, does not represent all veterans, nor do they represent the theater of war that they served in or didn't serve in. I was a surgical tech in the United States Army, and in surgery, there's the biggest mistake you can make, one of the most deadly mistakes, and lifelong, life-altering mistakes is to become too familiar, to think that you know what you know, to think as the nurse in the VA, uh, VA said to me about a week ago when I went in to have my knee looked at that she had been working at the VA for over 18 years. She feels like a veteran herself. We have to be careful of the words we choose. We have to be aware of how they can re-injure. I thought about her on the way here. <clears throat> so, when we came home, we just came home. We came to a hangar, kind of looked like that building over there. Uh, folks that were married got together with their significant others and they left us single soldiers behind and we figured out how to get back to the barracks. I didn't look like a veteran, let alone a combat veteran. Um, when I went for counseling within a few short months at Ireland Army Community Hospital, no one asked me about Mogadishu. It took years before I would talk about it. Avoidance is the most powerful symptom. Dr. Ellis, I'll never forget his name. He kept trying to back me up to Mogadishu. I wish I had a better picture of this. But, um, I won't throw him on the bus. I'm going to bus my old boyfriend. But um, <laughs> anybody can see this. How did even pass this around? I didn't, I didn't look like a veteran. I didn't look like a veteran. Y'all can pass this around. So where was the help? <clears throat> what were they going to do with me? 2001, hey, I ran it off. I ran, ran, ran. Forrest Gump, when I saw that movie, I was running too. <laughs> yeah, I thought, oh my, like if I had only thought, maybe I would have just ran around the whole entire island of Oahu. But um, I stuck to military bases. So yeah, I ran. Um, and when I got out, I was a workaholic until the towers fell, and then there was nowhere to run. And I found myself um, on the other side of the country, the Women's Trauma Recovery Program, with another woman who was neither um, a combat veteran, and sh the other stereotype, she wasn't raped in the military either. She had um, two traumas. She witnessed, uh, the, her, on her first shock, she witnessed a soldier before her fall to his death. She also was pinned um, on a mock convoy underneath a tractor trailer, the back end. Um, 
had an undiagnosed brain injury for many years. Coming home, I had no idea that um, some of the symptoms I was experiencing had much to do with not only my experience in Mogadishu, but the medication that we were given for malaria, an anti-malaria prophylactic called larium methylquin, which was black box warning in 2013, 20 years after we were poisoned. I continue for, even to this day, 24 years later, I continue to be humiliated by my providers, mental health providers, health care providers, physical medicine rehabilitation providers. No one wants to listen. They didn't listen to the Vietnam veterans. So what I do is, I go to the VA and I attach signs like this to my dog tags. And I, I hope that somebody listens. I hope that they Google it. I hope that when a veteran tells them something and they weren't there and they haven't seen the documentary yet or the Hollywood movie feature film, we were there. We know what happened. Larry Mefflequin is controversially now being used at Guantanamo Bay on prisoners due to its known psychiatric effects. It causes damage to the brain stem. And if I'm getting the terminology right. The damage is in the dorsal horn of the vagus nerve. In surgery, when we do head and neck dissections, we watch the vagus nerve like a hawk. The vagus nerve is responsible for 20 communication pathways in the body. So when we say brain damage, what does that preconceived notion alone bring up? When you share that with someone, I've got brain damage, what does that mean? <coughs> what does it look like? Well, for, for those of us who were poisoned, it means a lot of things. It means relentless insomnia, not mediated by psychotropics. For myself, it means chronic pain. It means chronic exhaustion. Difficulty concentrating, confusion, that seems to have um, gotten growingly worse as I've gotten older. <sighs> so, besides being poisoned, who was I going to tell about July 12, 1993, when in broad daylight I witnessed cobras move in on a building and blow up a building of we don't know the numbers, right? It's always a guess. It's always a guess. But I'm, I'm just so cynical and so jaded that if the numbers say 80, double it. So a couple hundred people were killed that day, July 12th. And the reporters that ran to the scene to turn their cameras on the truth, the Somalis came to get them, came to get them, said, we need you. We need you. We need you to come and show the world what the United States has done. It wasn't enough that we made a mistake. Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter. Do they? They didn't matter in Mogadishu. Instead of rendering care, Troops were sent in to finish off anyone or anything that was moving. We had less troops in Mogadishu than I've stood with at Dave Matthews Band concerts. Who was I going to tell the story to? I was going to be the crazy veteran in 1993. To say I was poisoned, we were poisoned. They poisoned us, Mom. We killed them, Dad. We weren't feeding them, Dad. 
We were killing them, Dad. I tried to think how in my family would believe me. How do you cut through the patriotism that holds up the lies? How do you cut through the nationalism that holds up the lies? I didn't get to be a warrior. I didn't get to be a veteran. I didn't get to be injured. But what I did get to be was disordered. And what I'm here to tell you today is I have been a witness for 18 years. I didn't come home to the Yellow Ribbon Brigade, but what I did come home to was Vietnam veterans. And they continued to save my life. And the biggest crime that ever happened to Vietnam veterans is that the best that the mental health community could offer was a disorder. But it was a post-traumatic stress disservice. It was a post-traumatic stress dishonor. And so what I'm asking all of you to do today is to rethink this idea of coming home from war and being disordered. <clears throat> to losing a child to childhood cancer and being disordered. To being raped and being disordered. Full disclosure, I don't have an army of Somalia veterans for full disclosure about what happened in Vietnam. But I do have Vietnam veterans that are willing to listen. And I have a community of veterans for peace that's willing to listen. We don't owe it to you to heal. We don't owe it to you to feel good about all that you have done in service to us. We don't owe you our stories, no matter how long we sit across from you. But if we give them to you, know that it is a sacred moment in time. And you are among the few. I'm in writing groups twice a month with Vietnam veterans, some whose now bald heads turn as red as this ink. sharing things that people say he never talked about. If you need to feel good about the work that you're doing, I want you to know that you absolutely should. And you do deserve that. And you do deserve to be honored in that work. But know that sometimes it's about sustaining a life and not forgetting and not letting go and not necessarily even honoring that service. But finding a way to make a life more livable. And so if we say, we don't want pills. Don't push the pills. There's no one size fit all. I was teamed. I was teamed. The National Center for PTSD on my second visit there, third residential treatment for PTSD. Teamed, I call it teamed, in a room of people. Um, it seemed like there felt like 10, maybe there was five. But they wanted to know why I didn't want to take medication. 
I was poisoned by medication. I don't trust medication. What was my diagnosis? What did they put in my record? So trust, bridging the gap of trust, begins with listening and putting aside your preconceived notions about what war is, what a theater of war is, what they are, what over there is, what a veteran looks like. In 2003, shortly after the invasion, the VA swallowed me like bad medicine. We weren't on the cover of Time magazine yet. No one knew that we were combat veterans. Poster Girl had not been made yet. My sister, Robin Murray, had not been walked down the red carpet in Hollywood yet. And so my intake interview was a bunch of bullshit ass sexual harassment. I was not asked about Mogadishu. I was asked whether or not I was raped in the military. I was asked whether or not I had a problem with men. I was asked whether or not I thought that it would be a problem to stay on the all-male combat PTSD ward. And there was only one other woman. She was a desert storm bed. I know they didn't ask my brothers those questions. They shuffled me through from group to group. No one listened. I'll never forget her name. Karen Smars, eight years, two months, and 11 days active duty soldier. All of my good conduct ribbons intact. Two, not one, but two honorable discharges for two enlistments. Six year in the first one, surgical tech, high stress job, operating room. Karen Smars, an unsupervised psych resident. Somehow decided that I had a personality disorder. It was never in my records before. I guess my my personality, I can only assume that it was disordered because I didn't want to clean the kitchen. They wanted disabled veterans to clean the kitchen. I refused. They wanted me to hold tight in the rec room as the fire alarm played. On and on and on. I went outside. I was told that I was a fire hazard because my garbage can was in front of my door to alert me when the housekeeper came through because he was so used to men being there. Previous night, he had just walked through that morning, actually, walked past me, emptied my trash, went into my bathroom, and began to scrub the toilet. You have the power to not only take someone's life, but to really damage it for a long time. Vietnam veterans were told they had schizophrenia. I have a friend who's one of the most beautiful poets, most beautiful writers. His voice has given me sustainability. For 43 years, he feared that he was schizophrenic. For 43 years, he lost far more than he ever had to, far more than Vietnam ever had to take from him. And it wasn't, those parts weren't all taken from Vietnam. They were taken from sitting across from someone who was put in a position 
to write some things down and define a person. Our identities become shaped by the words that are, that are played out in the aftermath of coming home, whether it's coming home from war, just coming home from service. I have this slideshow. I'm not quite sure where I'm supposed to go here. Let's see. This was a writing prompt in a warrior writer's workshop in New Jersey with largely Vietnam veterans. Unclaimed remains. Underneath the rubble, underneath the noise in my brain, underneath the static, the <coughs> chaos, the fight to remain sane. Underneath the moonlight, starlight, Summertime, firefly gazing, flashback to Mogadishu midnight blue, so amazing. AK-47s and M-16 tracers and Cobra gunships go boom in the night. Epcot Center ain't never seen so bright. Mogadishu was no Disneyland, but let me tell you, they sure enough will take you by the hand and drag you from the back of a truck or maybe a van. 21 October rode in Mogadishu through the sand. Now, wave to the people. Where's the camera? Run, tell that. This land is our land. Black Hawk down, bang, bang, boogie. This ain't no game, homie. What you really don't know is that you really don't know me. Downed aircraft, gunship, graveyard stains. Busted, rusted, disgusted, <laughs> unclaimed remains. No monuments or memorials still to this day in Washington, D.C. or back in Mogadishu, the capital city. But those black hawks are preserved in cactus for all to see. This jaded, faded, unclaimed, red, white, and blue history. I want to leave you with two things. If you don't remember anything else, please, drremingtonnevin.com. He's the specialist in Larry and Methylquin poisoning. He's also a veteran. The Journey is the Destination. It's a feature film, which I sat in the audience at the New York premiere several weeks ago. I never heard deep wails like that in an audience before. Kathy Eldon, mother of Dan Eldon, one of the reporters who was killed in Mogadishu on July 12th, was there with his sister, Amy Eldon. And sitting in that theater, I wore this hat. I wore this hat to identify myself as a Somalia veteran because we had been forgotten for so long. It took me 20, 20 something years to get this hat. Just tired of being forgotten, blending in. I, I'm so used to wearing my hat now. And in that theater, it was Somalia veteran hat on my own. I wrote to it. I wrote to it. I didn't know what to do, but I wrote to it. I wrote to it in a warrior writers group. I wrote to it. I just wrote whatever came out. Greetings from Somalia. The journey is the destination. 24 years can't seem to leave it all behind. 
Still got the Malarium shakes and Mogadishu on my mind. Never heard deep wails like that in a movie theater before. Who was crying? How many? Permission to cry, ma'am? Yes, ma'am. Permission to cry, ma'am? Yes, ma'am. Kathy Eldon, how did she do it? How did she forgive the Somalis for killing her son, for stoning her son to death? How did she do it? I wanted to shrink in my chair. <laughs> Somalia veteran hat gone wrong. Sometimes it takes a feature film to really see yourself. That's what we looked like. That's what we did. We did that. Why did we do that? Why did we do that? Why did we do that? To really see yourself. See what you look like. Lock you into a chair. Make you squirm. Who did we think we were? Who the fuck did we think we were? Pointing our weapons in the direction of them over there. And a flashback is not a Hollywood movie. Sometimes it happens on a bright, sunny day. And it's not every day that you see a Somali woman with her children in a New Jersey pizzeria. She said that People often ask her if she's from the islands. Her eyes as bright as her smile. Somalia shining through her chocolate skin. Hair no longer laden with the parched winds of Africa, but with the winds of a blow dryer. No textiles to robe her from her head to her feet the gap version of her former self. Assimilation. For becoming American, she pays through her children, their tongue no longer her own. Iska Warren, I said. Her jaw drops as my son places a quarter in the gumball machine behind me. Ah, you know Somali? A confused look comes over her face. She searches for the answer in my fair skin and freckled arms as my son's gumball falls to the dirty floor. Mogadishu, I said. Oh no, may he have another corner? Sure. Thank you so much. I said. She slips a quarter into my son's hand and suddenly all of the Somali children screamed in my head as I watched her son and daughter. Water, water, water. Fuck you, America. America, fuck you. And the guilt of hellfire raining on her people rips through my being, transporting me back to convoying at full speed, heart pounding, blood racing, past begging children under the facade of a humanitarian mission. <coughs> Son pops the bright green gumball into his mouth. 
peace had been restored to my unknown American boy. Thank you for listening. It's not that often that a woman veteran is past the microphone. I've got a lot more to say, um, but I'm sure we're going to continue this conversation. I believe that um, there's going to be great change to come out of today. And we're going to start a new conversation. And we're going to restore honor to the psychological, emotional, and moral injuries that come with service, both at home and abroad. Thank you for listening.